Welcome to the VMware Multi-Cloud Podcast. My name is Eric Nelson, and with me today I have my co-host, David Jasso. David, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Great, great. Well, we're going to do another show today on uh, multi-cloud topics, and today's topic is Tanzu, VMware's containers and Kubernetes portfolio. On the show today, we have John Harrison, Senior Cloud Native Architect, and Timmy Carr, Staff Architect... Uh, uh, both of these guys came from Heptios, so welcome, John and Timmy. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Thank you for having us. Oh, great, yeah. great. Well, uh, again, it's coming into VMworld season, and so we thought we would uh, talk a little bit about Tanzu. And uh, Tanzu, then the best way to do that is uh, to get somebody from Heptios in, because Heptios, uh, we acquired Heptios. You guys uh, basically uh, are the founders, or the company was founded by the guys that invented Kubernetes, right, at Google. So thought it'd be great to have both of you come and talk about architectural issues around what we're doing with Tanzu, which is is, uh, again, our uh, containers and Kubernetes portfolio. So we always start with, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, what have you done in the industry? Uh, and now that you've joined the VMware collection, uh, what are you working on at VMware? So, uh, John, why don't we start with you and uh, give us uh, the elevator pitch of who you are and what are you working on? Yeah, sure. So uh, I actually came into Heptio right around the acquisition with VMware. So I did all my interviews and in assuming I was going to join Heptio. The day I was meant to get my offer letter, uh, I woke up and I saw the news that Heptio had been acquired by VMware. So I, I joined right on the, I was recruited through Heptio, but actually joined VMware in January. So I've been here around 10 months now, I guess. Um, prior to that, I was at Docker. So I've been at the container mm -hmm. space a long time and I was right. uh, a senior technical account manager for the West region. So um, based up in Seattle. So here for 10 months and loving it. All right, uh, Timmy, tell us about yourself. Yeah, so I'm Timmy Carr. I'm based in Chicago. Like you said, I came over from that Heptio acquisition. Um, I was at Heptio for what I would call uh, six months prior to that acquisition being announced. Um, prior to that, I worked uh, in the cloud automation orchestration space at a VMware partner named Ahead out of the Chicago area. Um, while I was there, I did my VCDX and was involved in the VMware uh, ecosystem, but really, uh, really moved towards the cloud native space as quickly as I possibly could because I really wanted to get closer to the applications. Hey, uh, guys, uh, I've heard a little bit about Heptio, but maybe you guys can tell us a little bit more in terms of what was Heptio all about and, and I, you know, who the uh, founders were of it because I know that they, they were pretty uh, instrumental with um, launching Kubernetes at Google. Yeah, so Heptio was all about upstream Kubernetes, right? And really, it was Kubernetes was uh, Google was something that was open sourced out of Google, right? And a couple of the people that were very early uh, people involved with the project, Joe Beta and Craig McClucky, uh, left Google and kind of went kind of went their own ways actually uh, for a little bit of time, and then decided that this Kubernetes thing was actually kind of gaining some uh, like steam in the marketplace. Ultimately, they decided to come together and build a pretty unique company around Kubernetes as a whole. They had visions about how Kubernetes was going to have to be uh, operationalized by enterprises. And in order to meet those visions, they developed a kind of world-class group of like consultants who were actually able to help folks run upstream Kubernetes in their enterprises. And so there was the consulting arm of the organization that that was really helped feeding, help help to feed the product arm. And a lot of those open source, early open source projects that you saw like Heptio uh, and Valero and Contour uh, were kind of the result of that. Um, and, and, and we really kind of ticked on with some um, internal planning and with some internal things that happened. What we ended up, what we ended up seeing was this acquisition by VMware. But really when you see this uh, thing that we're gonna talk a little bit later about this Tanzu uh, mission control bit, um, we had a lot of early ideas about that very thing. So that was something that was happening behind the scenes uh, really from the get-go of Heptio, right? And so it was really exciting to see both that product journey, but also um, all the ways that we helped uh, enterprises as a part of that vision. Now we continue to do here at VMware. Go ahead. Yeah, I like, I, I, you know, I heard, I've heard Joe talk, and it, it's, it's, it's interesting to see that when uh, – Kubernetes hit the enterprise market. It was really wild, wild west. There was there was no good standard practices. You had Docker. You had everybody doing various things, and 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 then the big enterprises jumped in. IBM and everybody else started Cisco, and everybody started uh, you know 
proposing solutions, and it it kind of from an enterprise perspective, you you looked at it and go, I don't I don't know which way to go. And so I saw Joe come in and really understand like the maturation of the enterprise IT in looking at modern apps. And so I guess it it feels like uh, the Heptio acquisition, um, Joe and crew really thought that there was alignment between uh, us and 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 uh, Heptio because this notion that enterprise IT, which we have 4 million enterprise IT guys, we're actually, you know, struggling with what does it mean to roll Kubernetes out in an enterprise, right? So it seems like there was a, a good connection between what Heptio was trying to do and the needs of, of VMware customers. Yeah, I feel like it was a, like, I think the, the kinship there was kind of, um, certainly when I was talking to Craig really in the early days of joining, you know, when I was kind of thinking about joining a knot, he was saying, well, look, VMware has had this experience of leading kind of a paradigm shift and a technology revolution in the industry with virtualization. I think he saw the same ability to kind of partner up and do that kind of thing with Kubernetes this time instead. So yeah, I, I definitely think there's a lot of parallels in kind of the strategy and vision. There. Let me, let me ask you guys a question. Cause a uh, little, I've looked at Heptio. What struck me is, um, this idea of like the democratization of Kubernetes, right? It's like bringing it to the masses because, you know, it's fairly complex, right? I mean, you know, sort of a standalone, you know, the, you, so really if you want to scale this up and and really really be able to drive this across your enterprise, there's, there's uh, quite a bit to do there. But it seems like a lot of what you guys were focused on was really how do we, you know, sort of make this easier for uh, lots of folks to engage with rather than sort of leaving it for just like, you know, the most sophisticated enterprises. Is there any, any truth to that or is that sort of just something I made up on my own here? <laughs> no, Kubernetes is fundamentally super complex, right? you're going to install like upstream vanilla Kubernetes, um, you really need a kind of a tour guide to the ecosystem. And that's one of the things that we really specialized in doing at Heptio and now at, now at VMware as a part of the essential PKS team, right? Um, one of the things that struck me is that everything that we really did at Heptio was around making that better for people, right? So a lot of the upstream stuff that you see, a lot of this open source stuff, uh, a great example here is Sonoboy, right? Um, that tool, is its job is to take a look and scan uh, clusters that exist in environments and to determine if they're actually constructed properly. Like, did you follow the right like patterns and guidelines such that this cluster meets the, the Kubernetes end-to-end -end conformance tests? And the reason that was built is because once upon a time, right. Joe was out doing field engineering engagements, right? And like, he, he had problems with customers and they were the basic problems. Like the customer didn't actually install this thing right. So they built this tool and they pushed it out to the pushed it out to the open source community and now it's become the standard that all Kubernetes platforms actually standardize on, which is pretty great. Awesome. I think outside of tooling, you know, the community has often been, you know, it's often cited as one of the reasons that Kubernetes has been so popular. And I think very early on, you know, community efforts. I still remember going to meetups in the Seattle office for Heptio, talking about operators way back in the early days, introducing tooling like Case on it to the, the community, and also things like TGIK. You know, thank thank God it's Kubernetes on Friday or whatever. Um, you know, that was originally started with with Joe and Chris Nova, and now you know several of our colleagues, Duffy and other folks, get involved. Just disseminating free information on Kubernetes tooling and tooling in the CNCF kind of ecosystem, just about generally leveling folk up, right? I think it's all about um, getting as much information as Kubernetes, uh, about Kubernetes as we can out into the community um, and just leveling everyone up. Because like Timmy says, you know, it is complex and, and everyone needs help. And, you know, we're trying to, comes back to that democratization for sure. Yeah, uh, thank God it's Kubernetes. That was a YouTube series, right, that you guys launched? Yep, and it's still, still going strong. I think cool. episode 80s, in the 80s, 90s now maybe? PGIK.io, I believe. Cool. All right, so let's uh, let's change uh, focus for a little bit now and move up the stack and say like, so we have Kubernetes, which is an infrastructure that manages apps, right, or manages deployment of technologies to build apps. But let's let's talk about you know then you have the modern apps movement today, right? Like so, there's the Kubernetes infrastructure that allows you to run modern apps. But then where is modern apps as well today? Because that's also adds complexity because there's there's different 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 definition of modern apps and meshes and service meshes and so where is is the modern apps movement today, is it starting to mature as well? 
Yeah. So I think when you have a look at like where the application space is as a whole, like I find that, you know, we've gone from um, like IT seems to move in pendulums, right? So we start with the mainframe and we break that out. And then we and then we come back together and then we break that out again like as you look at the different iterations of of compute and i think applications kind of follow those exact same sort of patterns so as you look at customers trying to um break apart the different components of their of their big business running applications what what you see is you see different teams being responsible for those different like components of those applications and those different teams in some scenarios wanting to leverage even different tooling and really just be responsible for an SLA of the API of the of the tool in question right or the of the app in question and i think we're seeing more and more of that now all of this is complicated by the fact that like we have um, we have these interdependencies between all of those things. And really this is why Kubernetes exists because Kubernetes like gives us the ability to take like and manage the effect, the effectiveness of these applications running number one, number two, it allows them to kind of discover one another within a cluster. Right. But I said that within a cluster. And I think that a lot of folks like, like, where are we today? We're just at the point where we have these apps and we have this, these desires of different business units to do their distributed thing. But we're also at this inflection point where we're, where we have enterprises taking a look at this and saying, yeah, I also have compliance requirements and, and security requirements around those sorts of things. And I also have processes in place for dealing with those. And we're at like an inflection point between those app requirements and also trying to, in a um, high velocity capability, being able to put those same sort of compliance and security requirements around. At least that's my take, John. Yeah, I think a lot of this started with kind of, you know, modern apps, uh, you know, the 12, well, I think the 12 factor app was the first kind of genesis of like what a modern app is. And I was actually just looking on GitHub to see when the first commit was. It's like almost 10 years old now, I think, the 12 factor app, which is like, I think originally came out of Heroku, um, which was like a set of principles that like a modern app should adhere to, to be scalable and should be. Um, but I think out of that, we've got things like cloud native apps now with the advent of containers, of course, like obviously containers exist in some form when, when the 12 factor app came out, but certainly there was no Docker and no Kubernetes. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's tough going into customers and you always want to evangelize the new cool stuff, right? Around modern apps, but you realize like most, most applications are going to be brownfield. Um, you know, there's some greenfield and it's how do you, meld all that stuff together? How do you how do you help customers kind of mold their brownfield apps to work on these more modern platforms and take advantage of these primitives that we're trying to put in, you know, around Kubernetes and some other modern tooling. So I think it's I think it's tough. Like everyone if they could would have would have greenfield applications. Um, but I think it's just about kind of molding that into you know, how do we how do we create a platform for everything to run alongside each other? Hey, you, you both are customer facing and you're out there talking to folks and you know, picking up on the things we've talked about here, are you seeing that directly with the the customer you guys are talking to? Definitely. So like so much, so much so that we had to like come up with like a new kind of terminology and phrase for how we were going to address this problem. Because when everyone hears the term legacy apps, they think, you know, well, that's old, that's bad. You know, we uh, like, I think it was Craig that actually came up with this. We, we've kind of coined a new phrase like heritage apps. Like these are not only these, it's not bad. These are, these are often applications that make our business tons of money. Right? Heritage, so like, <laughs> that sounds good rather than legacy. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like, you've got your legacy infrastructure over here and your modern infrastructure over here. It's like, we need to make, we need to make this sound like it's okay. And really that we need, we need to do that for the business because in a lot of ways, to John's point earlier, like the businesses are running these apps that are, that are brownfield. And really it's like, if you look at how you begin to chip away at that brownfield kind of architecture and move it towards a newer, more modern and more, um, more uh, capable of high velocity sort of architecture, um, like that what you need to do is you need to actually um, kind of enable those characteristics with your application that's gonna that's gonna really um, that's gonna bring it to that next level. And and in doing so, like we've got to apply new principles, right? And so it's about taking that heritage application and maybe, you know, tweaking a component here or breaking apart a component there and to, along your journey to really fully distributing that application. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, that's that's more realistic to way, you know, I've run a data center in the past, right? And I, I know what I've got and I would call them classic apps, right? Things that I'm making a bunch of money that I want to keep running, right? Coca-Cola Classic, it's a great thing and 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 they do well. But at the same time, you want to pick them apart and uh, expand them and, and make them scale better, right? And and there's some pieces you want to rewrite and there's other pieces you want to, you know, maybe objectize and, you know, put a REST API on it and allow people to interf interface with it. So um, I definitely see that the, 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 I think the challenge that I've always struggled with, um, is how many new acronyms there are coming into the market, right? How many new startups there are with these acronyms that I don't understand. So there's just almost like, I can't seem to get educated fast enough to keep up with what I want to actually design as an architect. Right. Um, and so that's one of the challenges I think you guys have. And, you know, we, 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 we mentioned about, uh, you know, the, the, the Academy, I think we call it Kubernetes Academy or whatever so that um tell tell us a little bit about how you're, you're you're dealing with you know bringing a guy like me who's a classic it guy running classic apps into this fold and helping me you know process it yeah i think the the, the point or the original reason behind kube academy um as we're now calling it is you know it was again part of the extension of that democratization of kubernetes but how do we introduce kubernetes to new audiences especially now we're kind of embedded firmly in vmware how do we introduce kubernetes to uvi admins folks that have been working with you know maybe vcenter or operations folks you know primarily the target audience but but, but also developers how do we provide these bite-sized chunks which is you know free to consume or if you want to want to take it as more of a learning path you can um, you know, hey, how do I do um, authentication in Kubernetes? Hey, what's a service in Kubernetes? I keep hearing this thing, you know, like you said, there's lots of acronyms. Hey, I keep hearing someone's done a deployment in Kubernetes or it's running as a pod. What, what is a pod? What is a deployment? So working through some of these kind of definitions, but working through some of the concepts and architecture through, you know, mini little demos or, or slideware and things like that, diagrams. I think we're just trying to kind of bring, bring as much information to folks as we can to bring um, a new audience into this kind of cloud native Kubernetes that's world. Cool. The Academy, the Kubernetes Academy, is that's on YouTube as well, right? That's something you guys launched recently, sort of the evolution of the thank God it's Friday Kubernetes thing to now a more structured Academy. Um, that's on YouTube. And, and what are you guys seeing in terms of uptake on that? Yeah, so to get to the site, if you just go to cube.academy, right, like that you, you'll you get forwarded to like our, our internal, like not internal, but our site that we have published, right? And really there's courses there for anyone that wants to learn, right? I think the difference between this and TGIK, like concretely, is that TGIK is really a area where we explore something that might be new to Kubernetes. So, or some, some sort of like maybe emerging concept in Kubernetes. So there's very often um, Joe at his computer saying, hey, I heard there's this new project out there. Let's take a look at it and let's see if it works and let's see what it does, right? There's those sorts of episodes on TGIK. And then there's also some episodes where he'll like delve into maybe a more advanced Kubernetes topic, like maybe right. open policy agent or something like that. Kube Academy is really designed to get people up to speed with Kubernetes, right? And we're going to keep moving that, keep moving in that direction. We wish we had more content published, but really, uh, like time-wise, it's hard to get this stuff done. Uh, but like at this point, it's really kind of basic content to help people get started from the ground level. That's the goal. Yeah, I got to tell you a funny story too, because let's just first uh, for people listening, uh, spell out the the web URL at kub dot. What is the what is the URL? Yeah, it's K U B E dot A C A D E M Y. So there you go. Cube.academy then dot com or just that's it. Just cube.academy. You own the cavity academy domain name. Got it. Cool. Okay. So now I'll tell you the funny story, right? Like, so I work for a VP, uh, Chris Nelson, love the guy, bless his heart. Right. And he's like, Hey, have you been to Cube Academy yet? And I'm like, yeah, you know, you know, I run Kubernetes on my raspberry Pis and I mess around. I'm a, a tinker it guy nowadays. And, uh, so I know en enough to be dangerous, but not that much. So I'm pretty much an intro it guy to this topic, but I, you know, Cube Academy for me comes at it from a structured standpoint of teaching me the basics. And, and my VP is like, yeah, that stuff is like 
way over my head. I have no idea what they're talking about. Are you sure that's entry level? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure it's entry level. But the, the, you know, it's a funny story. Entry level to various people def- are defined differently depending on who you are. But for an IT guy, I think you start at the, the basics of understanding what Kubernetes is and then takes you in and you can learn in a methodical way so that I'm not trying to understand what acronyms are from crazy startups, but you're actually taking me on that journey, right? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, uh, and, and actually that kind of tallies with some feedback we've got some other places. I think it's really easy to bias yourself when you're when you're right in the middle of it, right? And just saying, well, like, this is beginner knowledge, um, you know, but I, I think uh, I think we're going to try and get some more true 101, 101 content, although I got to say, it's it's great that the VP is, is watching it and, uh, you know, and, and somebody kind of understanding it. I also wanted to pick up slightly, you mentioned about what the uptake had been, and I think uh, it was pushed a little bit at, at VMworld and in North America and San Francisco a few months ago. Uh, but I don't think it's been pushed kind of in any kind of official channels, maybe, you know, some tweets and things like that. And I think I'm sure that, you know, we in marketing had this idea of how many folks we thought would, would view the videos and how many folks we thought would sign up uh, because you can sign up to have a learning path, but you, you don't have to, to view the videos. So, so everything's free. Um, and I think they would, we were just kind of blown away. I think it was like almost 10 X of what we projected actually came to view the videos and signed up. So on, just on the uptake that it was, honestly, it's kind of crazy actually. Awesome. Yeah. It's a, I gotta say when we do podcasts and we talk about, uh, modern apps and cloud to- topics in general, uh, I get double the no- number of downloads on every single podcast we do. So I get like typically 5,000 a week listening to my weekly podcast that I run on just the core traditional it topics. Uh, we do it every Wednesday. Um, but then when we throw in a cloud or cloud native apps or uh, Tanzu in that, uh, I get 10,000 downloads, right. Or I double that number. So the, IT practitioner audience and architects are really uh, wanting to consume this this these topics because I think they see you know it a, f- a forward path in what they're doing as they up level into cloud services. You know your rack and stack jobs are starting to go away, and your architecture jobs are more your your uh, DevOps and interacting with developers. These are kind of career paths for a lot of the IT practitioners that that we work with today. When you start looking at the cloud migration that's going to be happening. So yeah, it's great to have this. And I think VMware, you know, is in a perfect position to offer a, 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 a stepping stone way to get where you need to go without needing to uh, figure out 300 new startups with uh, a thousand different acronyms. So yeah, uh, good to have that. Hey guys, we're, uh, let's maybe switch gears a little bit and talk about um, VMworld. Um, we're about two weeks out of Barcelona and uh, folks may not know this, but Barcelona, to a large degree, about eighty percent, maybe even ninety percent of the contents, uh, sort of encore of what uh, what we did in the U.S. There are some new things that come out because there's some time in between, and it's a different marketplace. But uh, there's a lot that uh, is the same. When uh, we did uh, VMworld the U.S. August, um, maybe you can take us through some of the news that we, you know, some of the news we did around um, Tanzu, I and mean, that was big news. We announced the name, but sort of what we covered in that in 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 the, the keynotes, the showcase, I think it was, in terms of some of the big things that were announced, and you know, both things that um, you know were already in the portfolio, but some of the things that were coming. Yeah, I think we can break this apart, right? So. You know, if you're if you're the classic VMware person and you're you're listening to this podcast because um, you know you care about running your hypervisor at the highest levels in your data center, right? Like, th- I think the thing that's going to hit home to you like very very quickly is this Project Pacific announcement. Right. And really, what that is is that's bringing Kubernetes and more importantly, right? Like we we talk about bringing Kubernetes to vSphere, but more importantly, it's going to bring the Kubernetes API to vSphere as really a way that we might be able to start managing VMware and vSphere type constructs. So that's, I mean, like, if, if, like, so the fact that Kubernetes is going to be running natively in your VMware environment, that's cool. But like the API and leveraging the uh, declarative nature of the API to say, hey, cube control create VM in my VMware environment, that's coming. And that's like probably the biggest earth shifting news that's happened out of that Project Pacific announcement. But man, there were some other really, really big ones. Uh, you know, you want to talk a little bit, John, about uh, Tanzu Mission Control? This is a big one too. Yeah, so Tanzu Mission Control is kind of the first 
product that we're talking about. I think it was launched in technical preview. Maybe this is the point where we should do the obligatory legal, like anything we talk about is not uh, not approved, may not come out in GA. We don't know any dates. Don't yeah, you, you hit it right, John. It was, <laughs> it was technical preview and we announced it and we didn't talk about where it's going and we've already uh, done some things on it. So, uh, so yeah, in terms of Tanzu Mission Control, so, so Tanzu is going to be the, the overarching portfolio name for, for the Kubernetes stuff. But uh, Tanzu Mission Control was the first thing we really announced. And that was to try and solve this problem of, of cluster explosion. Like, I think, you know, we'll talk about it a bit more later in, in the show, I guess. But um, it used to be that way back in the, the original early dark days that creating Kubernetes clusters was really difficult, right? So you'd create one. And then you'd nurture it like a pet because you didn't want to do anything to it. It was very difficult to maintain. Uh, all of your development teams would perhaps use one cluster. Uh, but now, with you know, with some of the open source projects like Cluster API that, that VMware contributes a lot to, and KubeADM that VMware also contributes to, both part of the cluster's lifecycle, special interest group um, upstream, creating Kubernetes clusters is now pretty easy. And you see things like EKS and, and GKE and some of the cloud providers and things like that. You know, it's now really easy to get a Kubernetes cluster. So we've got a different problem, which is how do we maintain the sprawl? So I think Tansu Mission Control is an effort to provide a control plane, a consistent control plane for things like access and policy uh, and security and visibility across uh, a disparate number of clusters, across you know, multi-cloud, on-prem, edge, things like that. So in terms of managing your Kubernetes clusters, if you're an administrator or someone who's now being asked to provide clusters and manage clusters for development teams, um, you know, tons of mission control is, is going to be huge in trying to achieve that. All right, interesting. Yeah. So I have a question on that. Just tons of mission control. What is that? Is that a web app? Is it a plug into vCenter? Uh, what, what actually is uh, going to be a tons of mission control pane of glass? Yeah, so here's the deal, right? So if you hear and you listen to Pat talk, just about any time he talks on any stage, doesn't matter if it's reInvent, it doesn't matter if it's VMworld. Like the, the thing, the overarching theme that you're going to hear Pat start to talk about, investor calls as well, is around um, SaaS, software as a service, right? And the mission here with Tanzu Mission Control is to deliver this product uniquely in SaaS. And the reason behind that, right? So especially when in dealing with like legacy enterprise vendors, or legacy enterprise customers, right? Or heritage enterprise customers. Thank you, uh, thank you. Uh -huh. Exactly. No, the, in, in doing this, right? Like what we look at is we look at all sorts of security uh, requirements, but like if you look at also the traditional kind of um, cadence of the VMware release cycle, the drumbeat, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's not fast enough for delivering new features in the, in the cloud native world. That's part of the reason for SaaS. The idea is here. The idea here is that let's get a product out there that people can start using and find out what features really matter to folks, right? And so we have some, we have a thesis around how this should work, but it will be delivered as SaaS. It's going to have a web UI. So if you're a, if you're leveraging that, if you're leveraging that um, nice new uh, vSphere kind of web UI that's out there, um, you're going to be able to leverage something that looks very similar to manage all of these clusters for you. Right? Nice delivered in a web browser for you to manage. All right, that answered my question, right? Yeah, Which is web, web uh, SaaS-based interface to allow me to manage uh, my clusters. And I was, I was in the Modern uh, App Showcase at uh, VMworld, and um, they put up a nice, you know, I would call it a architecture probably, but it, it, it had uh, sort of the core functions of uh, mission control um, and thinking of sort of lifecycle management, identity access. Maybe you can talk about some of those core functions that'll be part of what mission control delivers, basically. Yeah, I think like, so I think uh, there's two main ways of getting your cluster onto mission control. So you can attach an existing cluster. Um, so Tanzu will give you, you know, spit out a, a manifest that I can apply to an existing cluster, which will go and register itself. So I can attach clusters I might already have, or I can provision new clusters in cloud providers using the cluster API project under the hood. So once I've got those clusters under my control, I think the main things that, that folks are going to be really excited about are things like the security policy. So I'll take a concrete example. Um, one of my customers right now is working through issues with how do we make sure that my developers can only pull images into the cluster for a particular namespace or a particular app from a certain registry. 
right? So I only want developers to be able to pull images from an approved registry where I might have scanned it for CVs and, and vulnerabilities and things like that. So with uh, Tons of Mission Control, you'll be able to define a policy over, you know, maybe not just one namespace in one cluster, but a, a number of different namespaces across multiple clusters where those developers might work and say, hey, only images can come from this registry. And then I can apply that as administrator and that policy will span multiple clusters, which is something really powerful. Cool, cool. And um, there were, um, you know, other features, I think, you know, around sort of like enterprise class features that you'd expect, like identity management, um, configuration management, security. Maybe you can talk a little bit about some of those capabilities. Yeah, identity management's all done through our cloud, our cloud portal interface that's common to other tools as well. And so there's a well-worn path around other VMware delivered services that are going to leverage this exact same sort of like integration for, you know, your existing, uh, your existing data sources for your users, right? So, so check, check that box, right? I think the other bits that are really pretty cool about the platform, you, you've got all kinds of capabilities to, um, like do things around security. Uh, John mentioned one of them around, you know, where you can pull things uh, from, you know, in the future, we're looking at how to make sure that we are by default ensuring that users, you know, maybe can't run applications as a root user on our cluster, which would be terribly bad, right? Like if you can do that, you can officially own pretty much any Kubernetes cluster out there, right? Um, we're looking at, we're also looking at uh, uh, possible ways for to manage audit and compliance standards across our cluster. So we need to make sure that you can audit the fact that me as Timmy did this in a cluster and that caused this to happen in a cluster. We're looking at how to enable that as part of this platform. Um, we're also looking um, around leveraging some of our existing technologies and integrations. Like VMware is a fantastic integrator of existing technologies, right? So you look at tools like the Wavefronts out there and the Cloud Health, you'll probably be seeing those sorts of tools being brought in for kind of deep level observability. Um, and then that Cloud Health bit being brought in for kind of cost and resource management as a whole. Uh, there's just a lot of, there's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot of features and we're really trying to prioritize which of these we really, really focus on early on in the marketplace. I think day one, it's all about making sure that we have the ability to manage these sets of clusters. And then ultimately the workspaces, which are the logical grouping of like what developers or people might be able to do in our environment across those, across those clusters. Question for you around, uh, you know, I'm sure people that listen to this are going to be wondering things like, well, how does this relate to something like EKS or AKS or PKS, for that matter? People think that people are already using potentially to 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 run their uh, Kubernetes um, um, their Kubernetes uh, platform, basically. It, it's effectively being their Kubernetes platform. What's the relationship of something like Mission Control to those things? So, I think Mission Control is going to be the layer on top. Right. I think one of the things you realize was, you know, folks will always have a reason that there will always be existing um, applications. There will always be existing clusters for certain historical reasons. You know, app teams really want to use something. You know, I think if experience has taught us anything, it's, you know, you, you don't want to try and tell developers and tell folks what they need to use. And, and people will already made existing investments in a whole bunch of technology suites. So I think Tanzu Mission Control is really trying to be the, the observability, the visibility and the management layer on top of what you have. Um, but also, you know, we give customers the ability to provision new clusters, you know, with uh, um, essential PKS, cluster API under the hood. Um, you could attach your enterprise PKS clusters that you might be running on-prem and vSphere environments, or you can attach your EKS clusters, right? They can all live side by side inside this one management plane. I think that's why it's going to be so uh, so awesome for operators to have that visibility across multiple different platforms with a single API and a single pane of glass. Yeah, and I think that what John said there, the one that the one that really hits me as someone who like was a part of this VMware community for for quite some time was hey, we're going to take this bit of software for manageability, like operations and, you know, uh, those sorts of things that administrators would need to do across this sort of environment. And in this in this case it's Kubernetes. Boy, this really sounds like something that VMware's done before, doesn't it? Right? Like so, so uh, the like the comparisons to like what VMware has done and what we're in the in in the pathway of doing right now with Kubernetes are are like like so. There's just so many of them. It really really excites me. 
Yeah, I can definitely see this. Uh, this, and I, I always, uh, I always take the uh, the idea that you don't have to outrun the bear. You just have to outrun, you know, the slowest person in the room, right? But it, it, and 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 I look at this and I go, like, who else is doing this, right? Like, I don't think there's anybody else, uh, you know, taking on this challenge of, you know, giving me a mission control plane that I can then plug in you know, other communities uh, clusters into. I can also. Project Pacific, I can, if I'm running on uh, vSphere, I can plug that in. And it, it really does give me that manageability. And I don't think, I think of Red Hat and I think of others that are kind of offering up point solutions in, in Kubernetes. I don't think there's anybody else doing anything like this that really tackles the enterprise view uh, like VMware has done when it, when you talk about AWS and cloud and uh, hybrid, hybrid offerings for virtualization. I think that this actually kind of takes it to that level, but from a Kubernetes perspective. Yeah, this this seems to be a true multi-cloud platform, right? Rather than where other people seem to be more narrow. Thoughts on that, guys? Ooh, multi-cloud, that word. Um, yeah, The so, word. This is the yeah, podcast oh series on multi-cloud. There's a, is there a hyphen in there or not? I can never tell. Right, is it hybrid multi-cloud or what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just think multi-cloud is so difficult. Um, even even if we're able to manage across multiple clouds, the, rea the reality of the situation is there are things like data gravity. And there's also things like each side of, like network availability and, and network ingress and egress that are all that are always going to drive the multi-cloud discussion. Mm -hmm. So while we can give you the ability to run your app in just about wherever we can deploy a Kubernetes in Tanzu Mission Control's capability, uh, in, in Tanzu Mission Control's world, um, what like we would still need to architect solutions to be able to drive traffic appropriately to your application, and that's still like there's still a lot of wood and wa wood to chop and water to carry to get all that sort of stuff. Uh, taken care of, but we're definitely up for it. And we're definitely working on that. Yeah. And I didn't mean to take us in the multi-cloud <laughs> as much as a multi-cluster environment where I might have different Kubernetes instances running that I could actually plug in and, and manage these through a mission control yeah. environment. And, and to Eric's question, which I sort of derailed, sorry about that guys, but uh, is anybody else doing anything like this? Uh, I think, you know, there are some folks out there. I, I think the, it's difficult for the the cloud providers to really make a big investment in that because obviously they want to sell what they're what they're running on their own platforms. You right, know, there are some right. folks out there like Rancho who who have been working in the space for a little bit. You know, both with their own distribution, but also trying to you know collate multi cluster and create a management plane. I mean, I think it's just a really hard problem, right? But I think you know a few folks have seen that that's really where where folks need more tooling. Uh, they need more you know observability over clusters. They need to be able to manage at scale. So. You know, I for sure think, you know, there are a couple of other tools maybe out there. There are other tools that I'm sure that, you know, we're not aware of that are going to be coming out soon because it's a hard problem. But um, I certainly think that the mission control looks like it's in a, a really good place. So at uh, VMworld, we, um, you know, the framework that uh, Greg McClucky talked about was really around this um, build, run, manage. We've talked a lot about manage, right? We've talked about manage and mission control being sort of the center point for that. We've talked about run and and what we're doing with Project Pacific. Maybe we can talk a little bit about build and sort of news there. And, um, you know, I'd love for you guys to talk about what the big news was um, in the build space uh, that we talked about at VMworld. I'll give yeah, sure. me a hint. Yeah, starts with P. <laughs> yeah, it starts with P and ends with pivotal. Yeah, there's a, yeah, no, no. The, look, we're very, very excited about the potential to have uh, this many developers join us on, in our in our like one vision. Like, if you look at pivotal, like their whole world is about enabling developers to deliver their applications more rapidly. And the thing that really kicked that off for Pivotal was this, uh, the Pivotal Cloud Foundry, right, PCF. Um, and that's really this opinionated platform for developers to leverage to, like, get the highest velocity out of the amount of delivery that they can do with their code over time, right? Like, so if there's a new feature, they want that new feature out as quickly as possible. And in doing this with this like with this platform that's very opinionated and 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 gives and gives choice enough so that most people have exactly what they need, they're helping developers achieve that. And they built all kinds of tooling all around that to make that that experience as simple as the CF push, right? Um, now, 
what what happened in the space, right? Well, like with every pendulum, like we kind of talk about the infrastructure going from mainframe distributed, right? Like there's also there, this exact same thing happens in like mindset for how you would want to deliver applications, right? There's the there's the hey, a very opinionated architecture gives you this capability, but there's also like the counterpoint to that that well, maybe some of these choices aren't appropriate for what how we want to deliver our applications and. Kind of as a result of that, Kubernetes became this platform that was then utilized to help deliver some of those other services. And so I just think it's a very good complement, right? Like we all have the same vision, help developers get their apps to production more rapidly, right? Pivotal has an existing uh, spring user base of just a ridiculous amount of people, right? And so if we look at those people and we look at how do we enable those people to make more choices about how they want to potentially deliver their software, this is good for everyone, right? And bring all of that together and focus on that common goal. I'm just really, I'm actually pretty excited for it. Yes, it's a, you know, mergers, like acquisitions, like all of that aside, right? I've been through one of those now with the Heptio acquisition. It was a great experience coming to VMware. Like, I'm very excited to see all of that happen and help us help us build out that run story that you heard about at VMware. How about uh, Bitnami was uh, mentioned as part of that run story too. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, like part of this focus on developer experience and, you know, I'm sure Timmy will agree, like we see this in customers all the time. Developers are demanding better platforms, better tooling, self-service. You know, it's all about trying to deliver business value quicker. Um, and I think, you know, part of that thing, part of the story with, with Pivotal was the ability to have a catalog of applications. Obviously, that's an area that Bitnami is super strong in, having this catalog of well-packaged, standardized applications um, that folks can just go and pull. You know, they have a great history in, you know, AWS marketplaces and, and cloud provider marketplaces, right? And say, hey, I want a Jenkins instance, or hey, I want a, you know, Nginx instance or something like that. Being able to bring that self-service app catalog experience to developers on a Kubernetes platform, you know, coupled with the experience of Pivotal in that area as well, um, is going to be huge, right? You know, developers now, they just, you know, they want a, a new queuing, RabbitMQ or a Cassandra or something like that. They can pull those standardized um, applications from like a Bitnami catalog, um, you know, coupled with the kind of experience you might get from CF push, that kind of thing, which we know developers love from, from being in customers. I think uh, in terms of leveling up the developer experience and really focusing on the applications, uh, both super exciting. I have a question. It's a novice question, but I'll throw it out there because it's just a podcast here. On Bitnami, do they have an on-prem hosted version of that as well? I know they have a SaaS service, Bitnami. And you guys might not know this, but uh, we, we need to go look that up and get that answer, which is I get the Bitnami. You know, we want to deploy. I've used it for deploying into clouds and, you know, I get going and deploying bits. But I'm just wondering, I always use Bitnami that's configured by somebody else, right? I'm just wondering if I get Bitnami, whether I can put that in and instead of using docker hub or whatever i can use bitnami as my repository on prem i always have that question i got to get that answer yeah I, I don't know the answer to it i do know that uh, what the way it gets consumed often is through other catalogs as well so you know they plug it in and there are some number of catalogs that are probably c configured for on premise management right uh, i'm going to i'm going to go look that up so all right. Uh, the last thing, uh, as we kind of come up to the, the the last ten minutes or so of the podcast, um, I always like to you know talk about Barcelona. Are you guys going to be there? Are you guys giving any talks? Uh, and then, what's the rest of the year look like? What are your kind of kind of goals and objectives? Are you going to be at AWS reInvent as well? What what are, what are the kind of the things you're looking to close out the year doing? And then, what are some of your next year's goals? Yeah, for me, uh, I'll be at uh, uh, VMworld Barcelona. I'm going to be presenting with my colleague Olive Power, who uh, who, and we'll be giving a talk on like the guts and guts and glory of operationalizing Kubernetes in your enterprise. Um, and unfortunately, like like the purpose of that talk is really, hey, how do we enable people who are like maybe enterprise architects or maybe, you know, VI admins to like even get started with that, with that question, right? How do you get, how would you get Kubernetes running in your environment? What are the things you need to be thinking about? How do you educate yourself in order to be able to make the right decisions around those sorts of things? And it's really just a grab bag session around, hey, these are the tools out there. This is how Kubernetes works. So you have a framework for how, how you need to understand the system. And then here's some other resources that you can leverage to get going. Cool. Anything else beyond um, Barcelona? Not really for me beyond Barcelona, but uh, how about you, John? 
Yeah, I'm, so I'm not going to be Barcelona. Uh, Barcelona just sounds terrible. Um, no, I, <laughs> uh, no, I have uh, I have been picked, unfortunately, so I, I can't make it. Um, although I, I did do a panel uh, and ask the Kubernetes experts panel at VMware US, and they are doing the same panel at Barcelona. So you should definitely go and check out the, the panel and uh, and Timmy and Olive's talk. Uh, for me, not not going to reinvent, but I will be at KubeCon. This will be three years in a row now, so uh, I'll be. I think I've signed up for a bunch of sessions manning the booth as well. So uh, if you're going to be at KubeCon, come and see me at the booth. What are you looking forward to at KubeCon? I, I just love the the community. I love that everyone. I mean, I was like I said, three years in a row. So I think the first one I went to was like maybe two thousand people, and I think this one's planned to be like 10, 12, cool. something like that. I don't know what the numbers were. So like the explosion has been absolutely insane. Um, honestly, it's because we're a distributed company, right? I think Pepto was like 100, 110 people, mostly all over the place. It's really cool to get the get the band together, right? And just see all of the colleagues. And uh, oh, except, unfortunately, Timmy, I didn't realize he wasn't going. But um, you know, see folks, meet up with customers. A lot of my customers are going to be there. A lot of vendors. You know, it's always such a blast to keep going and all of the co-located events. Do with security, um, and also we're going to be launching some uh, some new Cube Academy content. Uh, at KubeCon, so that's going to be cool too. We're actually just finishing up recording it this week. So. When it, when and where is that, just for people that are listening? It's going to be in San Diego, and I've never been to San Diego before, so I'm super excited about that. Uh, and I believe it's the 18th of November, is it? 18th to the 21st of November. So like less than a month. Oh, man. Yeah, so if you need wonderful weather in November and you have an IT budget that will let you go, hey, check out KubeCon. Yeah. yeah, I will say the one thing that like strikes me about KubeCon as a conference, like number one, I've never been, but you can see all these sessions online. So even if you don't get to go, like start looking at the KubeCon sessions online. And one thing you'll quickly notice is that this is not a vendor led conference. This is a community led conference, meaning that you're going to get a lot of talks around what's happening in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, and then you're going to get a lot and then you're going to get these other talks about how people are like, leveraging the thing in the Kubernetes ecosystem. And so those are the most valuable things that I find to, to like watch in terms of sessions online. Hey, Eric, question for you. I think VMworld now, you can see it online or yes, uh, you can. register. You just have to register. Yeah, you, just, you can register. They publish everything. I think they go like maybe three weeks before everything gets up for non-paid attendees. So paid attendees can go in and look at everything like that week. And then unpaid, you know, somewhere three or four weeks later, everything's up in an un So U.S. Thing. would be up. And yeah, U U.S. is already up, up for everybody. And then uh, Europe will probably hit sometime in mid-December. So for your yeah, Christmas great. holiday, and you can go. Just so anybody that's listening, there are, there are a lot of great sessions that were done on um, on Tanzu for uh, VMworld US, and it's probably another great resource for you to learn more about it. Yeah, and then uh, I, I always throw a uh, shout out to you know YouTube channels. The the Friday thing can we can we point people accurately at the uh, thank God it's Kubernetes Friday uh, YouTube channel? Like, do you guys know what that is? Uh, because I think there's lots of YouTube. I'll, I'll just while you guys look that up, I'll, I'll kill some time here and just say that. Uh, uh, as I'm educating myself, I, I go on YouTube channels and there's some really great architects talking, mm -hmm. uh, through subjects. You can look at guys that have implemented, uh, you know, a Kubernetes big projects and where they failed and how they failed and how they had to fix it. And so there's really, really great talks all over the place when you start talking about, you know, wanting to get architectural content. Um, I definitely would say, you know, YouTube searches, you can find really great talks all over the place that are published. So. You guys, you guys find the URL? Well, and also, what's Absolutely. the number? What's the number yeah. of sessions you've already delivered? So we're at we're at uh, stream number ninety four, ninety four, um, right. which is which is great. And like a little funny story, like for me, like TGIK is what made me go to Heptio. I like Joe started this series, and I and I watched, and I'm like, I got to go work there. I want to learn this stuff. That's exactly where I need to go. That, that's, that's Joe Beta, that's right? Joe yeah. Beta. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, absolutely. And if you want to see all of these talks, it's T-G-I-K dot I-O. And that will take you right to the TGI Kubernetes uh, channel on YouTube. And that's where you can pick us up every Friday. Nice, nice. Is there a Twitter Twitter handle on uh on uh, the stuff that Joe and crew, or what are what are some of the so things that people in the community, if you're new to this community, where would they go follow? Obviously, go watch the videos. There's probably lots of comments where people are talking about the ecosystem. I'm just trying to get uh, a sense of uh, if you're new, you're one of our 4 million practitioners, and you're starting to get exposed to this, how else could you get involved? So KubeCon is a great one. Go watch the videos. Go uh, look at the chigik.io to go find those. 
yeah. do we have a do we have a, a Tanzu Twitter handle yet? I'm sure I'm sure there is, and um, I don't know what it is offhand, but and uh, I know Joe's got like upwards of twenty thousand followers. Joe Beta and Craig yeah. also has a lot of followers as well. Craig McCoy. Say, uh, J J Beta at on Twitter, uh, and also uh, our colleague Duffy puts out a whole bunch of great stuff. He also hosts TGIK a lot, so I think he's Maui Lion on Twitter. So J Beta and Maui Lion. Actually, have an interesting uh, how TGIK started story. So I co-run a DevOps meetup in Seattle, uh, and we invited Joe to come and give an introduction to Kubernetes when Kubernetes was still kind of early on, and it's for a, a meetup for in the morning for DevOps folks. And he came and gave it, and it was super well received, and it was super popular. And out of that, he's told this story somewhere else, I think, he realized there was a market for, for this content for people wanting to learn about Kubernetes, and that was the genesis for him wanting to start TGIK. Cool. Nice. Was, was he still at Google then? No, he was at Heptio, but it was pretty early on. Now, now, does he make like twenty million dollars an episode on his on his YouTube channel? Is he like <laughs> Kim Kardashian or other other people that uh, you know that have managed to monetize their YouTube channel? No, Joe's like like this is the best thing. Joe is the nicest and most humble individual. Like, really, he's great to work with. Um, and I, he, I don't know, he just did this for the community. He really want he really wants to do things right. One of our core values was chop wood, carry water at Heptio, right? Um, and, and carry the fire is a part of that, right? And what that really meant was, hey, um, we're going to have to do things to help this community thrive as Heptio, the company, and the community right. being Kubernetes. Like, and that means like putting out pod podcasts, putting out YouTube yep. channels. Chopping wood. Help people, yep. Right? Absolutely. And you mentioned like, hey, where else can I go? Right. Obviously, we mentioned uh, Kube Academy today. Um, also, slack.k8.io is the Kubernetes Slack. And anyone can sign up for an account there, do that, and jump into the Kubernetes Novices channel. There are just tons of people willing to help you at whatever level you are. We're going to meet you exactly where you are in your journey, even if that's helping, helping you through the documentation or helping figure out how to get started. It's a really wonderful and welcoming community. Check that out. Hey, uh, one more thing too that I just thought of uh, at reInvent, we were going to have we are going to have a workshop around Kubernetes. So if you're planning to go to um, to reInvent, um, you know, reach out to me at um, probably the easiest thing or. Um, yeah, sure. I don't, um, but um, but you'll also um, yeah, just probably reach out to me. Do you have a Twitter handle? Yeah, I don't have a Twitter handle. You don't have a Twitter handle. You don't have a Twitter handle. I actually have to kick you off. Sorry, you can't be a co-host. I actually have one. I'm just not using it very often these days. <laughs> are you allowed? Are you even are you even cloud native? If you don't have a Twitter? <laughs> no, absolutely not. And how can you podcast without a Twitter? Yeah. Twitter? I don't think um, we need this. David's new. We're bringing him up. Yeah. You can uh, you can direct him. I, I actually have one. I just I'm not using it too often, but I will start using it more. I'm Eric N I Pro E R I C N I P R O. And you follow me. I'll follow you back. I follow everybody back. I follow more people than follow me. And then uh, direct tweet me once we cross follow. You can have a conversation with me, and I'll get you hooked up to uh, Mister Twitter Handle is yes, here. Yeah, and uh, yeah. and uh, I'll just have to start using. Get it you going there. Uh, well, that sounds good. Sounds like uh, there's a lot of good places to engage here, which is great. You know, I have an architectural question. When I'm running Kubernetes on my Raspberry Pi, it always takes like 10 minutes to start. And sometimes it times out, and and the Kubernetes uh, online says don't put it on a Raspberry Pi uh, three because they're t they only have a one gig of memory. But I got it running anyway. Now I go to Raspberry Pi four. I got two gig, maybe four gig of memory. Are you guys ever going to really support Raspberry? Can, can you guys in open source land, you know, fix this stuff so the stuff boots up every time? I tell you, man, it, you make my life difficult. But uh, it's it's DNS. It's always DNS. Yes, DNS. <laughs> that's exactly it. We're going to be uh, running the Kubernetes on Raspberry Pi. Pi Labs at AWS reInvent, where we're getting uh, Dell uh, T5000 little uh, IoT servers that are going to be there, and then we're going to be running those master nodes and uh, and slaves uh, worker nodes. Sorry, not slaves worker nodes uh, running on uh, you know picking up workloads. Uh, we we do sensor workloads and put them on, on uh, Docker and uh, then download them and run them. So we will have VMware code uh, at uh, AWS reInvent in the area, and we will be directing people to Cube Academy as well and giving away some stuff 
there. So if you're planning on coming to AWS reInvent, definitely come to the area, check out the VMware booth. We're going to have Kubernetes stuff there. We're going to have Cube, uh, Cube Academy stuff there. And we're going to be giving away sensors and doing some co-marketing with uh, KubeCon, uh, no, not uh, Cube Academy, Dell, and ourselves. So it should be, should be good. So uh, cool. get, get there as well. Um, all right. I think we're, at the, we're coming up to an hour here. So again, John Harrison, Senior Cloud uh, Native Architect, and Timmy Carr, Staff Architect. Thanks a lot for coming on and uh, enlightening us and bringing the 4 million IT practitioners from VMware uh, along the journey, which I think we're all excited to start marching down the road. It's, it's going to be fun. Thanks a lot for, for joining us. Thanks, for Thanks having guys. Us. Yep. Thanks. Take care. All right. And with that, we'll be back again for the next one. I think we have some really good uh, topics lined up. I think uh, the yep. next one. Uh, I think we next doing? one we're going to be doing is um, talking about the app platform with Ahmad Benjamin, who was on our first podcast. And uh, then after that, I think we're looking at some stuff around uh, continuous verification and also some um, work around um, how to ha use data requirements to drive your application strategies. All right. And with that, uh, we'll let everybody go. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you in Barcelona if you can make it.